start. So I am Holly Marquis. I'm an instructor in the history department, and I'm also the director of the Women's Leadership Project. And I'm Amanda Cuday, and I'm an assistant professor of sociology, and I teach our Intro to Women's and Gender Study and Feminist Theory classes. So when we were putting together programming for this year for Women's Leadership Project, we really wanted to focus on intersectional feminism this semester. So I had asked Dr. Bouday if she would like your time stop this morning. And we decided to call it the other F word because it seems like feminism is almost treated like a third word. So we wanted to just start there and get some thoughts from you all about what is the fear of feminism all about? Yes, ma'am. Um, I feel like a lot of fear of feminism comes from if women gain more equality, then men lose equality. Sure, what else? Yeah, just spitball here. Just throw some ideas out. We want to keep this a little more conversational, perhaps. Than yeah, we promise it won't be like luxury, and we're not going to get deep into feminist theory today. So, power is a zero sum game. Traditional uh, Christian values. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, what do you mean by that, though? That's not self-explanatory. Yeah. Um, I think some people look at the Bible in a certain way, and uh, what's taught in churches, and also most pastors are men, and the Bible was written by mostly men to mostly men. So I think women can kind of be left out of the conversation or seen as just lesser. Interesting. Okay. Thanks for that. Some people worry that if they identify as feminist, uh, then people won't like them or will think their ideas are out there. <laughs> okay. So there, it's kind of an unpopular, um, perhaps, identity or label. It's associated with like the more, ex in some people's minds, the more extreme sense, like raw burning kind of like active protest. Yeah. 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 So yeah. So we found some images of um, some backlash uh, for feminism. So I need feminism because feminists are easy. Uh, I don't need feminism because I'm not a delusional, disgusting, hypocritical man hater. I respect men, and they respect me. I'm a spot a feminist, usually fat and ugly, always inherently unlikable, supremely hypocritical, snarky, annoying, deluded, and transient. You see this image of the brain, she's got roller derby and hate on her mind, dad <laughs> issues, bipolar disorder. Uh, hates men and everything to do with them. So um, these, by the way, just came from a Google search of feminism. This wasn't like backlash to feminism, anti-feminism. I just Googled feminism, and this is what comes up. So um, I think that backlash is, is really strong. Yeah, so, so this is really what we wanted to address a little bit today, some of the stereotypes about feminism. Talk a little bit about, well, what feminism actually is, particularly focusing on, on feminism as a political movement. Right? So there's lots of ways I think that we can think about feminism as far as um, cultural products that are a result of feminist activity, um, feminist theory and literature, uh, but we're going to mostly focus on feminist political action. So we just want to give a brief history of um, feminism and the women's rights movement. So feminism, women fighting for equal rights, has been around since the dawn of time, but the organized women's rights movement really gets its start in 1848. And by the way, we're, we're treating US feminism here. Uh, so 1848 at the Seneca Files Convention where Elizabeth Cady Stanton gives what she calls her first public speech. And she's talking about, um, she said the question of women's wrongs to be laid before the public, that woman herself ha must do this work, for women alone can understand the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth of their own degradation. Uh, so at this Seneca Falls Convention, uh, they pinned the Declaration of Sentiments, which is modeled after the uh, Declaration of Independence, and that is no coincidence. They're fighting against these institutional inequalities. They're fighting for having a voice in the government, having uh, the vote, having a say in the laws that they were governed by. And they're saying, look, we don't have a voice in the lawmaking. We're governed by the same laws as men, but we have no voice here. We can't sit on juries. We're not tried by a jury of our peers. There's an inequity in divorce law. Um, they're fighting for property rights. So uh, this is all about, in this first wave, fighting for these basic rights. 
um, that women should be recognized as full citizens uh, <coughs> by the government. You get all the same rights and privileges the government extends to men. So um, this first wave, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, they're really pushing for the right to vote and using that platform as a means to gain uh, other inroads. Uh, we've got pictures here of Alice Paul, Lucy Burns, a feminist picking <coughs> the uh, White House for the right to vote, which um, they are successful in their bid for gaining voting equality in 1920 with the ratification yeah. of the 19th Amendment. So just an important thing though, that this took 70 years, right, from uh, uh, oh, about 70 years to get from kind of initial mobilization to franchise. Mm -hmm. yeah. Alice Paul also pins the Equal Rights Amendment, which I'll bring up again. Um, it was defeated in 1923, but this is just to guarantee equality before the law. Now the second wave of feminism, or um, really 1960s, 1970s, is when it's going to take its root. It uh, is multifaceted, but they saw a tremendous amount of transformation in uh, public opportunities and educational opportunities in uh, personal sexual relationships. Um, so this is going to correspond with the civil rights movement, uh, women gaining protection uh, as piggybacking onto civil rights legislation. So Civil Rights Act of 1964, affirmative action, uh, but they're really growing impatient when the government's failing to take these seriously. Uh, so people like Betty Friday and Polly Murray, uh, several other leaders, they found the National Organization for Women in 1966. <coughs> so they say this is going to be like a double in, NAACP for women. They're going to fight for uh, legal rights. Um, I should back up. In the 1950s, Friday wrote The Feminine Mystique. Uh, in the first chapter, she says, uh, this is the problem that has no name. So basically saying uh, that women uh, are told that they're supposed to find their ultimate fulfillment by mopping their floors and, and caring for their husbands and their children. And um, this is really only geared toward, uh, or only really addresses white middle class women. Um, but it is important in raising consciousness and starting this dialogue. Uh, so she founds with Polly Murray, Murray the National Organization for Women. And they are campaigning for employment, equality, equality in politics and law and education and at the same time a radical feminist movement emerges as well so this radical feminist movement uh, or women's liberation um, kind of has this rise at the same time as uh, the national organization for women so they are mostly young uh, women who had gotten their feet wet in the civil rights struggle but found that men in civil rights movements these male leaders were often being dismissive of their own grievances or uh, ridiculing their claims of sex discrimination so they are uh, creating these independent women's liberation movements it really gets public attention as you can see this image down here below this is from the 1968 miss america pageant they protested um, now, keep in mind, this is a time where you'd be lucky to have three channels. So Miss America, it was a, like a big ticket television item. So it had a large audience to begin with, but there was a lot of coverage of this uh, protest. You can see on this picture, they have a sign that says, uh, welcome to the Miss America cattle auction. They crowned a live sheep. They had a mock pageant outside where they crowned this live sheep. They had 16 feminists sneak in and, and bring out this banner in the balcony that said women's liberation. They tossed uh, a home perm into the, one of the viewing booths of one of the big wigs. And he said that it was this noxious, noxious poison that had to flee the building, so he just couldn't handle the smell. So um, outside, they had what they called the freedom trash can, where it's a receptacle where they would take all of these symbols of their oppression, uh, their bras, their girdles, false eyelashes, copies of Playboy, high heels, all of these things, uh, and they put it into this trash can. Well, they couldn't get a fire permit, so they didn't actually light anything on fire, but the news reporting started using that phrase uh, for all burners, and, and it became have this negative association. They're likening it to draft dodgers who are, are burning their draft cards in this is Vietnam era. So um, this is where you get that image, as you mentioned, of you know these bra burning <coughs> feminists. This comes from this uh, pageant. 
forever name it never was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this protest was a huge success because it was a magnet for media attention. As I said, there was a, a large audience to begin with, but this uh, protest got a lot of attention. Uh, about 600 mostly unsympathetic young men gathered to watch them protest and in for all insults, they started telling these women that they should put themselves into this freedom trash can and light themselves on fire. Uh, so it got a lot of attention. And so really put women's liberation on the map. It got people talking. Um, so women and, and women's liberation start to have consciousness raising groups. They start getting together and talking about experiences that were very personal, very private, not really talked about prior to this. They start talking about rape and abortion and reproductive rights. Uh, marital rape starts to become a conversation where it wasn't before. So um, they realize that these what they consider to be personal problems represent this really entrenched system of discrimination. Um, now, these two movements that come up at the same time uh, blurred together in the 70s um, as more mainstream groups started to um, become more radical. I just want to make sure I wasn't like cutting you off. So, Three really important things before I move to the third wave, uh, really important developments out of the second wave of feminism. The first is that the birth control pill was approved by the FDA in 1960. So this has been uh, championed by Margaret Sanger, who was one of those early first wave feminists, this really early birth control advocate. She underwrites the research. Uh, so women have access to uh, birth control in 1960. Um, the second thing I need to bring up is the Griswold v. Connecticut case. So this is a Supreme Court case in 1965 that uh, overturned the state law that had forbid the use of contraceptives even within marriage. So now it's legal to use contraceptives, but what's really important about this piece of legislation is that the justice who writes this decision says uh, the right to be let alone is the beginning to all freedom. So the Constitution doesn't mention uh, the word privacy. It doesn't. Um, make any specific reference to the right to privacy, but here they're writing this in. They're saying uh, this is a matter of right to privacy. This right to privacy legislation leads to the Roe v. Wade case, 1973. So this is going to legalize abortion, but um, this is saying this is a right to privacy issue. <coughs> so um, that creates some backlash. Um, we have another movement to pick up the Equal Rights Amendment, so uh, an amendment uh, saying that civil rights can't be denied on the basis of one's sex. Uh, and this is uh, defeated in the late 70s, largely due to the fear-mongering of one Miss uh, Phyllis Schlafly, who goes all around on this tour for, for years telling people uh, there's going to be no more distinctions between men and women. Your daughters are going to war. Everyone's going to share the same bathroom. Uh, there's no distinctions. Um, she had really kind of uh, played on a lot of those traditional conservative family values and she was saying things like the way to stop rape on campus is that women need to be focused on finding a husband and then having a family and that you would be raped on campus if you weren't out looking for an education so um, she she really represents that extreme backlash that was pretty pervasive So moving into the third wave, this emerges in the 90s. And so it's got roots in the second wave of feminism. Uh, but these are women here who are young women who grew up having all of those um, things that we talked about with the second wave. So they grew up seeing a, a diversity in family forms. They grew up with mass media. And we know the role that that plays. Uh, we, they grow up in a time where women's studies is being offered on campuses. And so they grew up with all of this. Uh, so their version of feminism is a little bit different. It's shaped by those experiences. Um, it's much less organized. It's more diversified. Uh, they start to try to take back the power of words that have been used to oppress women. So we see third wave uh, feminists uh, taking back words like bitch and cunt and slut and trying to take away the damaging power of those words. Um, you can see uh, Bitch and Praise of Difficult Women uh, by Elizabeth Wurzel. I have a picture of that up there. She is a, a third wave feminist and she is very critical of a lot of things. Um, popular cultures, depiction of women. Um, she says the following. 
Um, but if we had really come a long way, baby, if men's perceptions of women had transformed fundamentally and intensely so that we were accepted as full-fledged sexual creatures and romantic operatives who were free to chase or be chased, and if this expanded dimension of women's sexual persona were not frightening or overwhelming to them, then we would not need the rules. And here she's talking about those rules uh, of, you know, don't call him, let him call you, don't ask him out, uh, be quiet, and don't be too smart. So she says, we would truly be free. So of course the bitch persona appeals to us. It's the illusion of liberation. What if you want to be large in a world that would have you be small, diminished? You don't want to diet, you don't want to say no thank you, and pretend somehow that there is that what is there is enough when always, always you want more. Not because you're greedy or an insatiable, because you can't help it. You go along with the fiction that the world would have you believe and adhere to, that you want to settle and be careful and accept the crumbs that are supposed to pass for a life. This minimized self that you're supposed to put up with, that feminism and other political theories of uh, women cannot really begin to address. So this third wave is all about not living off of those crumbs. Um, Okay. It. okay. I, just, I don't want to. I know I talk really quickly, and so we're kind of moving through this uh, so that we can set up for a, a discussion amongst all of us. So there is some sort of there is a debate on whether or not we are in a fourth wave of feminism, or really, really are we just moving into more of a um, intersectional uh, feminism? That's uh, feminism is not one size fits all. This is not saying that you have to believe uh, in what I believe in that you don't have to. Um, only address people who uh, look like you or think like you or act like you. Uh, we're not single issue people. So intersectional feminism is about equality for everyone, equality for all genders, equality for all races, all backgrounds, all religions, um, and it really addressing the, the way that we can't separate those things. You can't separate your womanhood from your sexual orientation. You can't separate your womanhood from your race. Um, this is a movement that's treating how feminism benefits men, which is something we'll talk about as well. So, the, and this term intersect, intersectionality comes from Kimberly Crenshaw, um, and Patricia Hill Collins is another um, kind of leading uh, theorist and scholar who talks about intersectionality. She uses the term the matrix of um, oppression or domination, and the, the idea here is that if you think about a spider web, Right, being a, a self-identity, basically. That we have these various webs and strands that make us who we are. They interlock, they intersect, right? And it's at those points, uh, those junctures where these various strands come together that define how we're going to experience, well, reality, right? And with that, um, oppression or privilege, right? And so, um, to varying degrees. And, but, and really, a lot of this came out of also the position that black women were in um, during the second wave, right? So we have to remember that 19, or so, sorry, we jumped um, now to the fourth, but you know, this all originated kind of in the, um, it, during the civil rights struggles and women's liberation. You, you have to think about where black women were positioned in that, right? On the one hand, they are fighting for, um, it, as part of the civil rights movement, for racial equality but always being told to sort of you know, take a back seat right, to male leaders, that they need to be in a supporting role. And on the other hand, they're in the women's, liber women's liberation movement, the second wave feminist movement, and being told, you know, well, you know, uh, black issues are kind of second to what we do. We're really about women's issues, right? But how do you as a black woman then separate those two parts of your identities? You need both racial uh, equality and gender <coughs> equality, right? And so this is where, as part of those consciousness raising circles grew, eventually intersectional feminism emerges from, but that's the, the kind of the root of it, right? Is trying to figure out um, how, do we, uh, how do we create a politics that represents us, right? And our social location. And of course it, it now, um, th this is used to describe much more than just black feminist um, experience, right? But, uh, which is why we have this uh, picture here of the Rosie the Riveters, uh, featuring disabled women, um, Muslim women, right, women of color, um, a variety of shades of color, right, and racial backgrounds. So, um, but the the other thing I wanted to say about that is not coming to my mind. Um, just in and out, just like that. Uh, <laughs> but um, so this has some implications too for. Uh, we talked about this a little bit in inequality last week. It has some implications for what kinds of contemporary political issues the women's movement is going to take up um, and uh, just how multifaceted the women's movement is going to be. 
For instance, Black Lives Matter um, is not necessarily a feminist movement, right? But for black women, it must be, right? So, um, so it's, it, it makes, it, things can become, become really difficult and it generates a lot of really um, important critical discourse in trying to tease out, right, wh what do our movements care about um, when we try to really think in intersectional ways. Okay, um, and so I, I wanted to think about, so as now that we've reviewed these various waves of, and, and accomplishments of the women's movement, what do you think about some of the um, consistent principles that appear in each of these waves of the, the women's movement? Uh, I think central to this, if we were to think about this as sort of pillars of, of feminist politics, central to this is political representation, right? That if you can't participate in a political system and make decisions about who is going to govern you and create laws, um, then you, you, if you don't have full citizenship, you can exercise no power, right, politically. Um, and so then, uh, on either side of this, I have edu equal education opportunities and reproductive autonomy. Um, and this is sort of my vision, by the way. Um, I, you know, I think it's well supported, but, um, but, I, <laughs> but at any rate, so I, um, so I see these two as kind of the next twin pillars, because once you have a political voice and the opportunity to exercise political power, you have to have education, on the one hand, so that you, ha you can make informed decisions about how to direct that political voice. And then on the other hand, you have to be able to control your fertility, right? Reproductive autonomy means self-determination. You have to be able to control your fertility in order to pursue educational and professional goals, right? And so that's why that access to um, contraceptive care and uh, legal medical abortion was so, such a central tenet of that second wave of feminism. It's about fertility control, really, right? Um, and then uh, I have on the side of this that employment non-discrimination and, uh, and also intersectionality, right? I mean, and, and you could argue, we could oh, go around for days about you know, the various, where these uh, pillars could be positioned. But intersectionality is such a critical point, uh, part of uh, feminist politics, as we just talked about. Um, and employment non-discrimination, right? You can, if you have the access to education, you have the political voice, but you enter work environments that are structured around both um, you know, norms and policies and operating procedures, but also kind of cultural practices that marginalize women, right, then you're, you're not gonna get very far with that education and political voice. You, you have to have economic self-sufficiency, right, which is another reason I see this as sort of a central pillar of the principles of feminist politics. Um, and then, uh, uh, lastly, but certainly not leastly, right, um, nonviolence is a central component of feminist movements. So this being um, uh, dealing with domestic violence, uh, dating violence, uh, sexual assault, uh, and rape, right? So um, all these have been central uh, tenets of feminist politics. And then I, I also included global connectivity on this because uh, in modern feminist politics, right, uh, U.S. women have, um, we're going to talk about sort of the, the work remaining, right, that, it, that it's not necessarily like every um, feminist fantasy, has, political fantasy has been achieved, but at the same time, compared relative to women across the globe, right, um, women in uh, Western nations enjoy pl political power in a way that a lot of women uh, in, in developing nations do not, right, and so um, that global connectivity refers to um, now this work of building bridges with those other women to extend the kinds of political uh, power and opportunities that women in the U.S., for example, um, enjoy. Um, show kind of a... Uh, oh, wait. Grant the right to vote. That's, Sorry. It's 100 years this week since the first women were granted the right to vote. Right, women have been allowed to vote for almost a lifetime of a fairly old tortoise. Oh, God. <laughs> I want to take this opportunity to consider how far we've come. That's interesting. Here, just hit the Google. I did, but it's still on the PowerPoint. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We'll get this. <laughs> Get it. It's 100 years this week since the first women were granted the right to vote. That's right, women have been allowed to vote for almost a lifespan of a fairly old tortoise. <laughs> and I want to take this opportunity to consider how far we've come. Well, back in 1918, a lot of nervous Normans in the media were panicking about the suffragette movement. Look at this poor man, 
holding a baby while his wife prances around in a hat high on gin and voting everywhere. <laughs> it was felt back then that women gaining equality meant a war on men. But the ultimate creeping thing was encapsulated in one question. What will men wear when women wear trousers? <laughs> Obviously, people were very concerned that there was a finite number of trousers in the world in 1918, and that's why women shouldn't get the vote. If women started wearing them, some poor gents would have to go without. But of course, everyone now accepts that women achieving equality doesn't mean men have to lose out. Isn't that right, Nish? Absolutely. Gender equality is great. Unbelievable naivety from Nish there. <laughs> <laughs> These headlines are from now. Some sections of the media are pushing the same agenda today as they were in 1918. Suzanne Benker on Fox News claims that feminism is a war on men. That's right, Nish. We're at war, you and I, you bastard. <laughs> oh. I am so bad at fighting that even that scared me. <laughs> Although you're a feminist and a man. What a world. <laughs> Should you punch yourself in the face? Do you want me to punch myself in the face? Not necessarily. <laughs> Sarah Vine is a male, referring to the outrage over the president's to a broke vest, also refers to this madness as the war on men. Now, perhaps calling it a war sounds a little bit inflammatory, but clearly for some millionaires, not being allowed to fondle a young woman over dinner is a lot like the song. <laughs> I suppose really it's a question of women being shown respect and not employed as sex objects. But it was a charity event, I hear you cry. How can men be expected to know when to donate to charity without the universal signal of a woman's arse in their hand? <laughs> I don't know. Nish, any idea? I mean, I normally just do it when there's a person with a bucket and change. So. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> The truth is, equality for women doesn't mean less equality for men. There'll be plenty of trousers for all. Long trousers, short trousers, the old posh man type red trousers that Nish wears on weekends. <laughs> Those were a gift, okay? <laughs> Finally, as we've seen, the attacks on the fight for gender equality continue much as they did in 1918. But tonight, we are celebrating an historic achievement. So let's finish on a positive. Well, firstly, CNN has declared 2018 to be the year of women. Yay! We've won the year! And it only took 2018 attempts against only one opponent. <laughs> Go women! <laughs> to, you know, well, of course, throw in something funny, but um, also talk about some of, uh, I think that in some respects, young women growing up today are growing up in what, well, uh, particularly as uh, was commented on in the video this year, right, it seems like uh, limitless opportunities for women, right, um, and uh, a lot of renewed political activity. Uh, there are still some, there's still some work <coughs> remaining, uh, and we, the, this Times article that I have, New York Times article that I have up here, Why Gender Equality Stalled, uh, as one example of some of the uh, work remaining for feminist politics, talks about how the structure of uh, workplaces, professional workplaces, uh, is really disadvantageous to women a lot of the time because women uh, continue to be expected to be the primary caretakers for children, right? But modern work environments, professional work environments, uh, still 
operate largely under a model that assumes that um, somebody is at home providing a lot of the work that is required for reproducing the daily life of the family, right? Like making meals and doing the laundry and running errands and taking care of kids and running people to appointments and doctors' uh, offices and things like that. Um, and so it, it becomes, the article talks about uh, how difficult it is for women to manage that work uh, along with their professional um, pursuits. So that was just one particular example um, that we wanted to talk about. But uh, we wanted to know from you a little bit about why, what you think about why young women often don't identify with feminism. Concept? Or? Either. Socially. Either. <laughs> I think some would be a little bit hesitant to identify with it because of the reasons we talked about as to why it's dirty work. You don't want someone to go, oh, you, you hate men or something like that. Okay, so that's sort of so like st stigma. Yeah. Well, if all you want is uh, 2.5 children and a white picket fence, you might think that there's not a lot else that needs to be fought for for you specifically, so you don't necessarily think that femini feminism needs to go further than that because you think that that's what it is, um, that you want to like take away that opportunity to be able to do that rather than give you the choice to do that and still be respected to do that. Um, so I think part of that is just they think that we've gone far enough and if we go further then something's gonna be taken away. I think that's an important point that uh, is sometimes neglected when you talk about feminism, that it's all about individual choice. So if a cho person does choose to, um, you know, get married, stay at home with their children, then that's perfectly acceptable and, and encouraged by feminists. It's all about uh, everyone having equality, and that part of that equality is making individual choices for what works best for you. So I, I think that's it. I'm glad you brought that up. I think another thing is that even though it's not really practiced, it's like written in law that we are supposed to be equal. So people say, oh, I mean, it's it's law. We're obviously treated equally when they might not have that discrimination. So they don't see it as the inequalities that other people see. Like the experience, if they don't, if they're not discriminated against or they don't see it like that, then it would be kind of hard to say that they, to them that it exists. I mean, that's an interesting point. If we have the statutes in place now, then why is there a need to continue to push for gender equality? So they're being practiced. I mean, you still have discrimination in the workforce that we attract. Um, we have men who sexually assaulted women at their jobs. So even though the laws are in place, that doesn't mean that all of them. And the laws don't cover everything. I also feel like we, some people just don't know enough. So if they don't know about the wage gap, or they don't know about all the opportunities <coughs> that they could have, so they're kind of content with where they're at. What, what was your comment about, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, there's, like, there's things that say, um, uh, prevent, like, there's, I feel like there's laws that say, perhaps you should pay women the same, but like, when you look in the movie industry, there's plenty of, Plenty of examples of like a woman getting paid less than her male coworker for being on screen at the same amount of time, um, and things like that in areas that are less regulated, um, like the arts, is probably somewhere where there's not as many laws regarding um, how to treat women. Then there's, if it's not covered by the law, then there's no law to break. So you can just, I mean, you can't just do it. You shouldn't be able to just do it, but they do anyway. Like people on both sides. Um, so I think that there's just some areas where the law doesn't cover it as well as it could, and so it's easier to not have to pretend like you're following a law if it doesn't exist. In that particular example, coupled with your comment about knowing, um, like for instance, how to file a grievance if you feel like you know you are um, experiencing a, a Title VII or a Title IX violation, right? Like, um, I I think there's also some vulnerability too, right? That um, you know, along with not having maybe uh, the knowledge about the resources that are available or the avenues that you need to pursue to address an injustice, there's also, you know, uh, a lot of women are not in a position to speak about something that may be happening to them or a rights violation. Because if you need bread on the table and your boss is a jerk, right, um, then you just need to take it 
so that you can get a paycheck and keep a roof over your head, right? Um, or food in your kids' mouths. And so uh, to speak out against something would jeopardize, you know, your, you would, would put you in a very vulnerable place, potentially. And the legal system is a lengthy and a tedious, sometimes year-long process. Uh, I know when it comes to sexual assault, um, a lot of, I've heard a lot of women say that um, at like conferences and stuff that they don't want to speak up because um, the legal process is so challenging and so time consuming and often doesn't even give them the result they want. And um, I think that could apply to um, like sexual harassment claims or other workplace claims because there's just hard to find like evidence for it. And there's also, it's hard to convince like a prejudice jury and it's, um, and then there's the just sort of the legal, like hiring a lawyer, meeting with them spending all this time and um, they already have a lot on their plate. So I think if the legal system was more efficient, it'd be different, but. Interesting, yeah, definitely. Um, one thing as you're talking that I'm thinking about is that of course, um, the example that I gave you from this time, the New York Times article is um, very like white middle class of me, right? That, uh, that, the, the, that the problem is ladders of opportunity, right? Um, where a lot of the work that, that we're seeing emerge right now in feminist politics is absolutely about addressing, you know, the vulnerable, more vulnerable women, right? That white middle class women have led, as when we went through this history, have sort of led uh, the women's movement for most of that history until much more recently, right? Um, and that's because it takes some privilege to advocate for yourself, right? Um, and so as the <coughs> women's movement becomes more diversified and intersectional uh, in both uh, character, right, characteristics of participants and also in the political issues that it pursues, uh, one example of that is, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about perhaps in just a second, but Time's Up, um, is uh, this is a movement, okay, if these are um, entertainers, right, and they have started a legal defense fund for women who are experiencing uh, employment, sexual harassment uh, by employers. And the intent of the money accumulated by this fund is that it would be used to defend vulnerable women. So working class women, women of color, women who don't have the funds to hire a lawyer and advocate for themselves, or who are perhaps, um, you know, again, just in a more disempowered position relative to, like myself, right, who would be in a great position to um, file a lawsuit or something like that, should I, should I need to. I'm educated, I have a secure job, right, a good middle class salary. Um, and so these are, this, this is specifically uh, to address more vulnerable groups of women. So that's the kind of modern work that we're seeing emerge. Yeah. I also kind of wanted to talk about how to, how, how more men need to get involved in, the, in, in feminism. How do we, how do we accomplish that? Yeah. How do we, well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to them. Um, we'll, we'll let you all. Um, and just to piggyback quickly on that, though, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, thrilled to see that there are a number of young men here today, uh, and so thank you for coming. At Equality last week, um, there were just a couple, very, just a couple young men, and um, the day before that, there was a screening of a Hidden Figures, uh, and there were, um, that was 100%, I believe, I, I was not able to attend that, but I believe that was 100% um, female audience for that film, right? So one, you know, I, so if men don't see themselves as being part of, you know, uh, conversations about gender, <coughs> right, or conversation about feminism, uh, that seems like it's kind of a problem. So what, what do we do about that? Well, I think it's important to talk about how this idea of masculinity or hypermasculinity is actually sort of detrimental to men. Um, and it doesn't allow them to embrace parts of them that would be considered more feminine, but aren't inherently feminine. They're part of just like human. being human. <laughs> yeah, that's why we put this image, uh, because we wanted to also talk about not necessarily how to get men to work to empower women, but uh, how feminism benefits men as well. This is about gender equality. This is about equality for all genders, not uh, you know, men, women, this is about all genders. So like, 
he's in this box of show no fear, provide, don't be soft, don't cry, play sports, cut your hair. So uh, I feel like in a lot of ways, as you're saying, men are kind of hemmed in by uh, hyper masculinity and uh, feminism benefits men as well. I mean, equal pay is a great example of that. If you have a spouse, a dual earner household where you have two equal earning spouses, uh, that's a win-win for everybody, right? <laughs> I think I've noticed that um, men who feel more comfortable are women are men that have like sisters uh, or like people in their circle that are women. Um, I think the people that struggle with understanding um, women's studies and other issues like that usually have just been around dudes their whole life or have just been nervous or weird feminism or women themselves. Um, and I think it's like a lot of other issues where we just need to sort of invite uh, people of both genders into our circle and really try to get different uh, points of view. Um, and just, I, I saw a really good tweet the other day that was also like, uh, it's not respecting women if you're only respecting women that you're attracted to. Um, so <laughs> I think also showing a universal respect uh, no matter who's across the table uh, or who you're having a conversation with um, will open us up to new thoughts and ideas. I think that um, something that helps is uh, we had a feminist comedian come onto campus um, a while ago. She was, she was hilarious. Um, but she talked about how, like, she addressed, she was like, so, men, have you ever learned to walk with your keys between your knuckles when you're going home? And they're like, what? Because people, like, if it's not a problem that you have, sometimes it is hard to see because sometimes it is, like, little quiet things we do to protect ourselves. And I think talking to people about that and, like, naming, like, how much I inconvenience myself during the day so that I don't get harassed. Um, and so, because if it's not your problem, it's harder to see. So naming those problems and naming those things that we have to do and seeing people be like, what, excuse me? And be like, yes, yes, huh. You see how this goes? We can work on this. Yeah. yeah. I think it's interesting that you mentioned the, com the comedian particularly, or comedy is a particularly effective uh, avenue to address some of these issues. Um, that was a, another thing, you know, that I see with, um, our kind of new women's movement activity that's been happening just in the past like year is what I'm really referring to. All the culture, like the um, really reclaiming culture and cultural <coughs> representations of women, right? So because we're getting close to when uh, we have like seven minutes before people have to leave to go to class. So, um, yeah, go. Okay. So we have this new momentum. Um, so we have, you know, Me Too, Hands Up. We've got uh, a new momentum for gender equality. But how do we how do we carry this momentum forward into real change? I think you have to work to get rid of. <coughs> oh, excuse me. I think uh, the feminist movement has a few facets that they can work on to carry the momentum forward. Working to get rid of the exclusionary dynamics, especially for transgender women and sex worker women. Um, I think that'd be a great start for sure. Yes. Yeah, so inclusion for, you know, gender equality for everyone. Equality, not even just gender, just equality for equality. everyone. Quality. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. You know, one thing that has just a, been a constant challenge for the women's movement is that if you think about, you know, what it takes to have political power, like a unified force, right? Uh, it is really hard to unify a group as diverse as women, right? Um, and so, and even just the definition of who counts as a woman is what you're um, you're kind of speaking to there. And so, those are the kinds of challenges that they they've always sort of been a part of. Uh, feminist politics and will always continue to be a part of it and you're right I mean it's essential to moving momentum forward yeah. I think also we need to exercise our right to vote I cannot <laughs> tell you how many college students female college students I've talked to who've never voted even though they're eligible some aren't even registered to vote so I mean go out and vote vote Educate yourself about who is out there who would be supportive of equality and for the issues that we are invested in. That's one thing. The other thing is um, when you have children, 
look at your child rearing practices, either a single parent home, two parent home, whatever, model the behaviors you wanna see, because your kids are gonna grow up to model and actualize those behaviors. So that's, that's a much longer term solution, <laughs> but again, it's something that we need to be thinking about. Oh, absolutely. And you know, and I, and I get that people feel a lot of times like, you know, um, what's the point of voting, particularly at the federal level, right? Like for the pre for presidential races that, you know, well, what does my vote really matter in the scheme of this? But it, it, it's the, and you're probably right about that, but it's the, maybe not, but it's the local level that it, you're, where your vote has the most impact. And that's particularly where young people don't vote your midterm elections, right, for your local candidates. That's where you have the greatest influence over shaping your community and your everyday life. And you just don't even, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, you. I mean, but we just don't even get out and, um, and exercise that, that political power, right? Well, I think this year we're seeing a reaction, uh, a reactionary movement for more diversity in people who are running. So yeah. we've got uh, trans people, we've got um, more women running, we've got yeah. people who recognize that, like, if things aren't going to change, like, we have to change them. And, and I think that's a step that's important. Absolutely. Also, off of what she said, just model the behavior among your friends. Yeah. And just yeah. people that you're around, like, just call people like, out. Call people out. Like, don't just go along with something you're uncomfortable with that somebody else probably is too. Say something. Yeah, so, it's hard, but. so some of the um, uh, actors and entertainers that started Me Too, Time's Up, um, so men, the um, actors started, or male actors started their own uh, version of that or a supportive campaign called Ask More of Him, mm -hmm. right? And if you Google that and look at some of their literature, um, that's exactly what they're talking about, right? That it's not just enough to say, you know, like, great job, ladies, you know, and and then think that like, oh, I'm being supportive, right? That it's about actively calling bullshit on stuff that you see every day, right? And, and shutting it down. It, and it's hard. It's hard to do that, to exercise that um, and not go along. It's easier to go along, path of least resistance. I think another thing is to show it as like something that's fun and positive, um, like the women's march itself. Was just, I went in Denver and it was like the coolest thing I think I've ever done in my life. But it was a fun experience and like we made a video about it and it was like really popular. All of my social media was like buzzing with like tell me more about it and I just had glowing reviews so now I have people who want to come with me next year. Like so it's just like something that's super fun and upbeat and positive. Like there are people who were performing, like just like random, you know, street performers would come to where the march was to perform, and there were um, motivational speakers, and uh, like that was just a really fun event. And so, if there were more things like that, I think it would, you know, make more attention and see it that feminism doesn't have to be like a super angry or yelling or like I don't know, like negative kind of thing. It can be something that's really fun too, and it should be. Thoughts. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, um, the more we see of women, like, uh, spearheading other issues as well, like Elizabeth Warren, for example, speaking on, uh, I believe it's a Senate floor, talking about the Bank Lobbyist Act and mm -hmm. denouncing it, and, uh, you know, I see some Parkland victims sticking up for gun control laws, and, you know, I think the Donald, the election of Donald Trump just proves the more we see of someone. Um, the more successful they're likely to be. So I think if, if uh, <laughs> women can, you know, gain media attention and uh, spearhead other issues or issues that include more people, I think they're most likely to get that support back to them. Definitely. So we need to normalize feminism in the ways we have had sexism normalized for all these years. Now we need to normalize. People like people, whether you want to be like, because my mom's voiced some things at times about like, you know, I had a friend who she had a friend who just wanted to stay at home, you know, and take care of her kids, and she got some flack for that because she had an education. Like, be accepting of women for what they want to do. That's the whole point of having choice is respecting people's choices. 
And so, like, including the people in your life in that conversation is <coughs> the best representative advocate for yourself and speak out and just, like, include people in those conversations. Like you were saying, be assertive and speak up and say something. Whether, you know, you want to be, like, solely devoted to your career or be at home active in a faith community or anything like that. Like, just advocate for yourself and for others wherever you <coughs> Yeah, I think that's a really good point. That um, that women who do decide to devote themselves to child care, to ter- caring for their children, shouldn't feel like they have to justify that, and they often do, right? And that's unfortunate. All right. Well, it's after one twenty, so I know some people have to get to class, but I appreciate you all coming. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.